the Deadspin origin story. Can you take us mm. through how that got started? Yeah, so I had done a site called uh, the Black Table, uh, mm -hmm. blacktable.com, which was with uh, basically it was three mutually, uh, three fellow underemployed 20 <laughs> something journalists in New York City. Uh, we were all working crap jobs that, that mo I was even, I was answering phones at the doctor's office when we started the Black Table. And we, you know, we all moved to New York to try to make it big. My web thing dropped and blew up. And so we all want, feel like we all moved there to try to create and make things and be exciting and be like these hungry, young, creative journalists and no one would hire us. And so we just said, let's just make our own site. So we made our site called the black table. There was four people. And I was kind of funny because now there's a, the two, the three people of three people were Eric Gillen, who basically like, is like, like head of products for Hearst or something now. I don't know, something businessy, uh, but he's doing very well. Uh, uh, Aileen Gallagher, who's a journalism professor at Syracuse and AJ Delario, who took over for me at, at Deadspin. And then uh, I don't remember what happened after that. Uh, but uh, at a certain level, um, you know, AJ is still one of my closest friends. I'm joking, of course. <laughs> but um, the point is that we were all kind of like frustrated. Uh, so we decided to make our own thing. And uh, it didn't really, wasn't really popular, but it was popular with like the right people in New York. It was kind of funny. It was irreverent. It, it, it was, it was original. And this was right around the time that Gawker was launched and Gawker was starting to get like some real traction among like the media community. And they were also just looking for stuff to link to. And we were not the Washington Post of the New York Times and we were making things. And so they kind of saw my work and I wrote, I used to write some sports stuff for them. And so they actually came to me and said, hey, so listen, Nick, uh, Nick Denton, uh, just got offered by Bodog.com. I don't remember Bodog.com. They were a gambling yeah. site before gambling was fully legal. And uh, they wanted to do a six month pop-up site about gambling. And they asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, actually, I think gambling about sports is bad. <laughs> Gambling's bad for the soul and, and, and it'll never work. No one will ever care about gambling. Totally proven correct on that one. And so they, uh, they basically asked, uh, so I said, I don't think you should do a gambling site. But while I have you, um, I actually think you guys should do like a Gawker for sports. I think there's like a ton of great stories that you guys should do there. And they said, uh, yeah, we've heard someone wanted to do that one time and it didn't work. So if you want to write a pitch, go ahead. So I basically just wrote like now what's kind of an infamous like five page memo. Cause again, I was very underemployed. I was desperate to try to, to I, I, this kind of seemed like my chance. So this long memo of basically the idea of how uh, I wanted to bridge the gap between the people that worked in sports and the people that consumed sports, the fans. Mm -hmm. And there always seemed to be a very clear wall between those things. As someone that had worked in journalism, but really felt, considered myself much more of a sports fan than a sports writer, uh, one, I thought that would be a strike zone in the middle to be able to try that and tell the stories. I, I had a bunch of friends that were sports reporters and they would tell me uh, like, oh my gosh, there's this awesome story. And they would tell me the story about an athlete or uh, the story behind the scenes. I'm like, oh, when's that gonna be in the paper? And they're like, I would never write that in the paper. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if there's a place to publish those stories. And so that, and so I kind of pitched that whole idea. They looked at it, uh, Gawker and Lockhart Steele, who was the managing editor at the time, and Nick looked at it and said, uh, hey, this is a great idea. Um, no one knows who you are, so we're going to give it to someone who knows who the, who has a name and you can assist that person. And I was so desperate. I was like, sure, fine. So they asked they asked Bill Simmons, they asked Dan Shanoff, they asked Jonah Carey, if we're thinking of going Thanks. from like dark names from the, from the recent times. And uh, they all turned it down. And so they came to me and said, uh, and said, okay, you're cheap. And <laughs> this thing doesn't work. No one knows who you are anyway. And so yeah, six months. And uh, that's how I became Deadspin. And, uh, and it really, I always felt like I had the benefit with Deadspin. A, it was just mine. Like I got to do it. Mm -hmm. It was entirely mine. Um, I didn't, I never looked at traffic numbers. So therefore I did not, I was able to do the site the way that I wanted to do it. And it really felt like this was my chance to finally, like I was struggling. I was, I was 30 years old when Deadspin started. Mm -hmm. Like I was not some young, cool kid. And so it really felt like the last chance for me. So I decided I'm going to do this ex exactly how I'd like to do it uh, and not let anyone in the world stop me from doing it the way I want to do it. And if it doesn't work, whatever. Maybe someone from New York Magazine or the New York Times will, will see it and hire me to write a story for them or something. And so that uh, – and so because of that – and also – no one at Gawker knew anything about sports. <laughs> so they didn't really know what I was doing. And th all that. So while I wasn't looking at traffic numbers, they were, and they could see it kind of building up an audience. The famous story about that is Nick Denton once texted me. He had heard that the NCAA tournament was popular. <laughs> so he once sent me, a, sorry, he didn't text me. He sent me an AOL instant message. Yeah. I mean, make sure that's more, that's more accurate. So an AOL instant message saying, Hey, Will, I wanted to ask, is the March madness, is it over? And I was like, well, it's July. So yes, <laughs> yes, it is in fact over. 
over uh, uh, now. So, uh, so yeah. So for me, uh, the having that advantage of not ha- uh, not having to appeal to a traffic board, mm-hmm. not having to to uh, to make oh, yeah, how are our numbers? Do we have any quick viral hits? This was so early on in the idea that the site could kind of be almost kind of my personal art project and kind of be the way I wanted it to be. And I really think that helped because I think people recognize I wasn't trying to sell them anything. I wasn't trying to trick them into reading the site. I was able to, my headlines were always esoteric and weird. I, I remember I, we did a, I did a post after, remember when Adam Morrison in, his, uh, in the Gonzaga game where he cried, yeah. the game where Gus Johnson lost his mind <laughs> and uh, Morrison started crying at the end of the game. And I literally put the headline, the headline of that piece was, it gets the feelings out. That was just a headline, (laughs) not SEO friendly, not SEO friendly, but anyone that got the joke, got the joke and thought it was funny. And that was what the site was about. The site was not about getting big hits or, or athlete photos. The idea was finding other smart people who thought about sports the way that I think fans actually thought and still do kind of think about sports and trying to find a community for it. So I don't know if I'm just perfectly in the Venn diagram because I was a Gawker fan and a sports fan, but it really felt like it did take off right from the beginning. Was there a specific moment you remember where you're like, all right, this thing has legs. Um, you know, I'm not going to go back to being underemployed, as you put it. Uh, I will never go back to not worrying that I'm going to go underemployed, to be, in, to be entirely clear. But I certainly think that there was... Um, uh, probably the, there were two really moments in the early days. Uh, one was someone had uh, was at a bar partying with Kyle Orton, uh, the then quarterback for the Chicago Bears, and and Orton was like Orton was having a great time, and he had like a ba- bottle of Jack and a and a, and a, and a beer in his hand. He was partying, and spilling on his shirt, and so and so they sent me the picture like, hey, me and my buddy Kyle are having a great time, and so and and, and like and the, the the thing that is important to remember about this piece, not only was this not meant to embarrass him, embarrass him. It was, they were like, oh my God, you have to post this too. We're having a great time because they, re- they were readers of Deadspin. And so I, so the headline was Bear Down Chicago Bear. And it became like a really big thing. And I think for a long time, because people in sports media were freaked out the fact that this thing existed, because also this was happening at the same time that the newspaper industry was starting to have struggles that had absolutely nothing to do with Deadspin whatsoever. But I think that it, be, I think it became a, people tried to make it like I was like paparazzi and like jumping out of bushes at people <laughs> or something. And I remember that P, that, got around a bunch of people thought because he was the starting quarterback for the bears at the time and i remember he got asked at practice the next day about it and he was like yeah it's hilarious man why i was so there's off day it wasn't the day before the game what's the big deal that seems kind of funny now as, as all the, the internet has changed so much in that time but like that was the spirit of the idea it was a it was Orton thought Orton and his buddy thought that would be humanizing and funny, which it was, and it was, mm-hmm. and I and and so that got big. And then I think the other thing is we had actually uh, I had a reporter friend of mine who had gotten word of a of a player that had been suspended for uh, PEDs. Now this was by the time where a player gets suspended for PEDs and it wouldn't even make the news. He would just be off for like six <laughs> games or something because it was before such a huge scandal. I think it was HGH was what it was. And so he kind of texted me and being like, he texted me like, hey, just so you know, here's the thing. So I published it on the site and all of a sudden on the ESPN crawl, it said Deadspin, it was Matt Lawton, I think was the player who that, uh, uh, Deadspin reports Matt Lawton. I was like, oh my God, I made the TV happen. That's weird. <laughs> I just made, I'm just sitting here typing in my computer and I made the TV happen. So um, that was, th- those moments it's kind of spun out and after that point that's when it started to be seen as a threat hmm. to people and that was very strange to me it, was, it seemed very odd to me because i always thought the site was written in a certain good cheer and a certain friendliness and a certain warmth and community and so the idea that it was being would be seen as a threat was i to be honest quite confusing and bewildering to me uh though i would learn uh, quickly uh, <laughs> that uh, that that was the case <laughs> 